Now today I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Greg Morris. He is known to many of us here, including myself, who've had foot problems at one time or another. In my case, having chronic Achilles tendinosis is a problem, but with proper care, I can still participate in sports like tennis, javelin throwing, walking, etc. As upright mammals, our feet are important in getting us around. I like the quote from Leonardo da Vinci who said, the human foot is a masterpiece of engineering and a work of art. Please welcome Greg. So Virginia, yes, um, as she mentioned, I'm Dr. Greg Morse, and I'm a podiatrist at Queens Medical Center, and also I go out to Queens West uh, one day a week also. So I've been here for almost 20 years now, um, and podiatry is a great profession. It's nice because I always tell patients I deal mostly with quality of life issues. I don't have to deal with the day-to-day, -day, you know, people being very sick, it's mostly like our javelin throwing Virginia. Uh, I can get her back to rock climbing and everything else with hopefully some... Uh, minimally invasive uh, treatment. Uh, today I'm just talking about, pediatry is nice, and it's amazing how many foot problems can occur. People always ask me, how can I always be so busy? And it's amazing. And it, you know, although I just take care of feet, uh, sorry if I start speaking quickly, go ahead and just, somebody t yell at me to slow down if I start speaking quickly. Yeah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> and you probably have to do that every five minutes or so. Um, it's amazing how many different problems can occur. And like uh, Virginia was talking about Leonardo da Vinci, it's an engineering masterpiece, the foot. Actually, when I was a Stanford undergrad, I started off as an engineer. And my mother, she taught medical school, and the foot amazed me in, in the process of, um, in my learning, I decided to switch over to podiatry, which has been a good fit for me. So today I was going to talk about uh, one of the most common foot problems, uh, heel pain or plantar fasciitis. Um, you know, you see things advertised on TV. Actually, I have six shoe stores for plantar fasciitis or other foot problems. And it's, it's the most common foot problem we see as a foot doctor. And sorry, what heel pain or plantar fasciitis is, is basically aggravation to the bottom of our foot. Very similar to tendinosis. It's just basically tendinitis to the bottom of our foot. And so what is plantar fasciitis? Plantar means the bottom of our foot. Fascia is another word for a ligament or tendon. So it's a very strong tendon that grabs onto the heel of our foot and then goes all the way to the ball of the foot. So the majority of people have pain mostly in their heel, and that's why we call it heel spurs or heel pain, um, arch pain, those type of things too. But basically, any pain from your heel all along the arch of your foot is typically plantar fasciitis. And it becomes irritated, and we're on our feet all day long, whether you're standing, walking, running, playing sports, we're on our foot and we strain that plantar fascia down there. And once it's aggravated, it's very hard to calm down because we're always on our feet. Um, and the result is heel pain. Now what causes it, once again, repetitive activity. Once again, I always tell patients, it's basically just tendonitis to the bottom of the foot. And once again, standing, walking, and running. A big culprit here in Hawaii is that here in Hawaii, we go barefoot a lot, which is fine when your feet don't hurt, but especially in the house, most people nowadays have hard floors. And whether it's you no know, wood or tile or stone, standing all day long on hard floors barefoot puts a lot of strain in that plantar fascia down there. And it's amazing how many patients I tell, hey, simply get a good pair of slippers or sandals in the house, and it makes a world of difference for plantar fasciitis. But, and then also, here in Hawaii, we go barefoot or we wear cheap, junky slippers. I tell patients once again, yeah, when we're in our 20s and 30s, you can wear junky slippers, but as we get older, Better shoes, better slippers, better sandals makes a big difference. And so, you no know, walking, standing, even just daily chores, you know, activities of daily living put a lot of strain on the plantar fascia. Sports, and you know, as we get older, we stay very active, and also it's one of our main act, you know, means of getting around is walking and standing, also another way of exercising, and just simply standing around the house. I often tell patients, standing still puts more strain on your plantar fascia than exercising. When we're exercising, our muscles are actually engaged and they take strain off the plantar fascia. It's when we're standing still. So especially if you're in the house. Am I talking slow enough still? So, okay. So especially in the house, when you're standing still at the kitchen, standing on the hard floors, especially in the kitchen, you know, cooking or cleaning, 
or doing laundry, when you're standing still, your fascia is being strained the entire time. And so that's, once again, very important to try and wear a pair of slippers or sandals in the house if it's aggravated. Um, oftentimes, I have patients in January or February coming in with plantar fasciitis because all of a sudden they decide to increase their exercise. A New Year's resolution, I'm going to start walking four or five days a week or running four or five days a week when they haven't ran or walked in 10 years. And so oftentimes it's a little overuse injury, uh, so a change in activity level. And once again, wearing non-supportive shoes and walking on the hard floors, and that's a big culprit here in Hawaii. Symptoms of plantar fasciitis, well, pain on the bottom of the foot. And once again, primarily pain back in the heel, but basically any pain along the arch of their foot is typically plantar fasciitis. Um, <clears throat> pain, a lot of people come in, they say, yes, I get out of bed in the morning. When I get out of bed, I have that horrible pain in my heel, or even just sitting for 10 or 15 minutes, sitting in, you know, at a meeting like this or in the car. And when they get up, all of a sudden they feel that sharp pain in their heel or their arch, and it typically it improves after they walk on it. And that's the problem, is that at first, you feel a slight pain, and then it goes away, so you ignore it. Like most of us, it's like, hey, it went away, I'll ignore it. But over time, if you continue to aggravate it, then it keeps on getting worse and worse, and that pain you have in the morning continues through the day or you know, becomes more severe. And then, once again, it increases over time. If you continue to aggravate it, it'll keep on getting worse and worse. And then, once again, a lot of times it warms up. People, once again, delay treatment because, oh, it hurt, but then I walk for a while and it warms up, or you know, it only hurts for a little bit or it doesn't hurt too much after that. The problem is, I tell patients, every time you feel that pain when you get out of bed in the morning or when you get out of a chair, you're aggravating it. And every time you aggravate it, tendonitis takes a good four or five weeks to go away. Every time you feel that pain, you just aggravate it and you start the whole healing process over again. And once again, you know, it warms up as you walk, but it returns once you sit. People, oh, I walked for a while and it felt good, but then I sat down for a while and I got up again, I feel that pain again. So what should you do? Well, get properly diagnosed. Luckily, the majority of the time, it's simply plantar fasciitis, heel pain, heel spurs. They're all the same thing. I tell patients it's hard to say plantar fasciitis, so it's okay to say heel pain or heel spurs or any other thing. And then to start a treatment plan. The sooner you start treating anything, the quicker it goes away. And fortunately for plantar fasciitis, 99% of patients get better without surgery. I always tell patients, yes, I do surgery for plantar fasciitis, but less than 1% of people require surgery. Typically, it goes away with the proper treatment. So what do you do about it? Well, first of all, evaluating and make sure it is plantar fasciitis. Other things can occur, stress fractures, you know, tears of the plantar fascia, fractured spurs, but typically it's, it's plantar fasciitis or tendonitis on the bottom of your foot. And the treatment plan is actually very straightforward. Um, people are always very surprised. It's like, well, that's all I need to do. You do need to do the treatment plan, but it just takes consistency. So once again, only about 1% or less than 1% of people require surgery for plantar fasciitis. It typically goes away with conservative treatment. It just takes time. And so the non-surgical treatment, the first line of treatment, well, inserts or shoes. Um, inserts, shoes, sandals, slippers. And once again, that's why I have my shoe stores or other you know, types of shoe stores. First of all, in the house. It's amazing how many patients simply get better wearing a good pair of slippers or sandals in the house. And here in Hawaii, it's like, oh, I don't want to wear shoes or sandals. Well, buy a separate pair, just keep it in the house. Or when you go to a friend, you can even bring one in your bag across there, too. And typically, people are very understanding. And it's amazing. Any kind of shoe, sandal, or slipper that has a little extra cushioning, a little bit of art support, also a small little heel or wedge. And I get patients all the time that come in, they go, yeah, actually, my, my wedges or heels feel better. When you're wearing a wedge sandal or a wedge heel, um, it takes a strain off your plantar fascia. I mean, first of all, it shifts the weight from your heel to the front of your foot. Second of all, by having a small little heel or wedge, it takes the stress off the plantar fascia. So oftentimes, a small heel or wedge helps with plantar fasciitis. It helps with a lot of foot problems. And that's why you see even most shoes have a small little wedge front to back about a half inch across here, and it takes the stress of our plantar fascia and other foot problems. So good shoes, good sandals, and slippers, especially in the house. Walking shoes, I look around, I see a lot of nice, supportive walking shoes. And I tell patients all the time, I have lots of patients in their 60s, 70s, and 80s 
that are wearing running shoes, not because they're runners, but they like the extra support and extra cushioning. It makes a big difference. Not only does the plantar fascia get strained when you walk around barefoot or flats, just naturally the aging process, the bottom of our foot becomes more bony. Our knuckles become larger over time, but more importantly, the fat pad on the bottom of the foot becomes thinner and thinner. The skin becomes thinner, so we're walking on bony feet. And so wearing good slippers, wearing good shoes, art supports, they all help take a little stress off the foot across there. Not just your feet, it also takes the stress off your back and knees. So good shoes, sandals, slippers, little art support, little heel or wedge makes a big difference. Stretching exercises, that's the second most important thing. The calf muscle makes your Achilles tendon, which forms the plantar fascia. And people always concentrate on, on stretching their plantar fascia on the bottom of the foot. If you read the internet, everybody's looking about, you know, okay, the bottom of the foot. And it is important to stretch the bottom of the foot, but the plantar fascia is a very dense tissue. It's very hard to stretch the plantar fascia. I always tell people, yes, it's important to stretch the plantar fascia, but more importantly, your Achilles, and most importantly, your calf muscle. Your calf muscle makes your Achilles tendon, which forms the plantar fascia. It's one big chain across there, but the calf muscle is where you get your biggest bang for the buck. Your calf muscle stretches very well, and you can massage it very well. Once that calf muscle loosens up, the pain goes away. And that's why in the morning time, it's tight. All night long when you're sleeping, your calf muscle, your Achilles, and your plantar fascia tighten up. And so when you first walk in the morning, you feel that sharp pain because it's being pulled or strained, and you're aggravating it. So simply stretching mainly that calf muscle makes a huge difference across there, too. And actually, I can do a quick demonstration. So when you're in bed or sitting around, simply put your leg straight with your knee straight, taking a towel or a belt and looping around your foot, and your typical calf stretch. And everything was, everything was stretching is nice and slow and easy. Every stretch, nice 10, 15 second stretches. I always tell patients, you can never stretch too much. You can stretch too hard or too fast, but as long as you're going nice and slow and easy, nice, long, sustained stretching. And so simply when you're in bed or sitting down, your leg straight and your foot out straight and use a towel or belt and loop it around your foot and pull back. So. in your calf muscle back there. So really important to engage that knee straight so you feel your calf muscle stretching out across here. That simple stretch relieves plantar fascia and Achilles tendonitis incredibly. During the daytime, your typical calf stretches against the wall. So your typical runner stretches where you stretch against the wall if your leg's straight, once again, so you feel most in your calf muscle. And I'll demonstrate the three stretches I like to use most. So first, with your calf straight, Leaning against the wall or a counter, leg straight, knee on the ground, your leg back, and you feel most in your calf muscle. Once again, 10, 15 seconds, nice, easy stretches. Relax, then bend your knee, simply come down, 10, 15 seconds. A really great stretch is your heel on the ground, and you put your toes on a curb or against the wall, and simply stretch nice and easy. Just move your body forward, and you feel that stretch. Simple, simple stretching, you just have to do it consistently. And there's no quick, easy fix, but stretching your calf muscle, your Achilles tendon, your plantar fascia, three or four times a day, especially in the morning, throughout the day, stretching. It's good not just for plantar fasciitis, it's the most important muscle you can stretch in your body. I tell people, stretching your calf muscle and then stretching your hamstrings takes care of so many foot, knee, back issues, it's amazing. And combine that with wearing good shoes, support, not going barefoot, those are the most important things you can do. Once again, modify your shoot footwear. Modify activities. I always tell people, I'm not a smart doctor. It's one of those things that if something hurts, don't do it. And so if you're you know, running five days a week and it hurts, well, then back it down a little bit. I tell patients all the time, it's okay to exercise. It's okay to run. It's okay to walk with plantar fasciitis as long as you don't feel like you're aggravating it. Oftentimes, people... You know, once again, it's what we call a training error. They do too much too quickly. And so that you know, New Year's resolution, I'm going to run five days a week. Well, maybe try twice a week or maybe go at a slower pace. Um, things we like to do to exercise, we walk faster, we do hills or inclines or stairs. By going, you no, know, maybe, maybe walk a flat course at first. Do Al Moana Beach Park or Capilani Park. Nice and slow and easy. Stop and do some stretching along the way before... And then more importantly, stretching afterwards, too. A lot of times people exercise, 
and they feel fine when they're exercising, but afterwards and they feel sore or tight. Because with exercising, it's all loose. But then you sit for 10 or 15 minutes, and the muscles tighten up across there. So really important to stretch before, but more importantly, to stretch after exercise. Nice, long, once again, sustained stretching. Just spending two or three minutes afterwards, you know, simple calf stretches does a world of difference. Icing the foot down. And so, once again, after activity, the fascia is inflamed across there. It typically doesn't hurt at first because it's warmed up, but then it tightens up. So I tell people, after, after you exercise or after you've been on your feet for a while, ice the heel down or arch down. The best way to do it, I tell people, get a little water bottle like this, this exact water bottle, put it in a freezer so it turns to ice. It's the most ultimate stretching, massaging, and icing bottle across here, too. So put this on the ground after you get done from walking and roll it back and forth along the arch and heel across there. And especially when it's frozen, it's nice and firm, and you're massaging and icing at the same time. The frozen water bottle works great. Or any kind of round object, tennis ball, golf ball, lacrosse ball. Uh, for some reason, people have lacrosse balls all the time. They go, I massage of a lacrosse ball. I, I don't know too many lacrosse players, but they have them. But so massaging and icing really works well. Um, actually, on this list, we don't have massaging. Massaging is up there very important also. So massaging with the tennis ball or the golf ball, lacrosse bottle or frozen water bottle. Once again, that's the arch of your foot which helps, but once again, the biggest improvement is the calf muscle. So really massaging that calf muscle. And one of the things I do, I send people to physical therapy a lot, and I want my physical therapist to get in there and work that calf muscle. Our entire life, our calf muscle is being tight. All day long when you stand or walk, the calf muscle is what's holding us up. And so that calf muscle is tightening up your whole entire life across there. As it tightens up, it puts more stress in the fascia. So stretching that calf muscle, very, very important but also massaging it. The good thing about the calf muscle, it responds very well to massaging. And at home, if you know, a lot of people nowadays have those foam rollers at home, so if you have one of those foam rollers at home, laying down and rolling that calf muscle with a foam roller. If you have a nice spouse or a mean spouse, have them massage that calf muscle across there too. And so massage that calf muscle. And I tell you, when I send people to physical therapy, I want them to be aggressive and really work that muscle. Because once that muscle loosens up, the pain goes away. Uh, or some people use like a rolling pin or those massaging sticks we have nowadays too, massaging that calf muscle any way you can. I tell people, when I do do surgery, which once again is less than 1% of people need surgery, all I do is go in there endoscopically, just like carpal tunnel surgery, actually use the same scope as our carpal tunnel surgery, I make a small little cut in the fascia and stretch it out a little bit, about a quarter inch. And so 99% of the time, if you do your proper stretching and massaging, you can stretch it out a quarter inch without having to have surgery across there, too. And then, once again, um, uh, medications such as ibuprofen. And I don't like taking medications. I got acid reflux and GERD, uh, but it does work well. And so taking ibuprofen, Advil, Leave, uh, Motrin, they're all very similar. But you need to take it twice a day for like three or four days in a row to calm inflammation down. And it's very effective. Anti-inflammatory medications are very effective at calming inflammation, you know, tendonitis, arthritis down, the problem is they have side effects. So I always tell patients, be careful, watch your stomach, make sure you don't have any kidney problems or any other interactions or medications across there too. But it is a very effective way to help calming down any kind of tendonitis as anti-inflammatories. Most patients, once again, it's like, ah, oh, I don't want to take them, or I take like one pill. Just taking one pill here and there doesn't really calm down inflammation. You need to take it more consistently, two pills twice a day, but talk to your doctor first. Make sure it's okay with your other medications or any other issues. Um, padding and strapping, once again. Art supports, shoes and sandals. Also at my store, at Long's, there's all different types of devices you can buy to help support the arch. Most of them typically help. Any kind of extra support, the fascia is just a strong band of tissue down there. So any kind of wrapping of your ankle, little ankle sleeve or arch sleeve, any kind of extra um, plantar fascia, you know, art support, sandals and slippers, takes the stress off of there and does work. A next modality, we use a night splint. A night splint is basically just a brace you wear at nighttime to keep your foot stretched out. Once again, it's all about your calf muscle and your Achilles tendon tightening up across there. So basically, the night splint's like a 90-degree angled brace you wear at nighttime. It works very well. I personally can't use it. I can't stand things on my feet when I sleep at nighttime. 
I tell people the first thing I do to a, a hotel room, I untuck the sheets. I can't have my feet bound across there. But I tell people if, if you're still in pain, the planner, uh, fashion night splint can be very effective. I tell people even if you only use it for an hour or two, it's helping stretch you out. Or if you're sitting at home, reading, watching TV, you can put it on also to keep your foot basically stretching out as much as you can. Uh, second line of treatment, once again, um, physical therapy. And so I always tell patients, let's try this first. Let's try the stretching, massaging, good shoes, slippers in the house, anti-inflammatory medication, and massaging. The majority of people get better with that. But to be able, after a month, if you don't see significant improvement after a month, we'll move to the second line of treatment, where you continue to do the stretching and the massaging and shoes, but then we add on possibly physical therapy. And once again, I really want them to get in there and work that calf muscle, the Achilles and the plantar fascia, stretching it out, teaching you better stretching techniques and massaging it out across there. Sometimes also ultrasound or other modalities physical therapy can use. Cortisone shots. Nobody wants a cortisone shot, and especially in their foot, it hurts really bad, but it does work miracles. And I tell people, as we get older, uh, I don't want to be sore for two months. Sometimes getting a shot early on is not a, a bad um, thing to help the calm these down. And especially with so many patients being unable to take anti-inflammatory medication for one reason or another. So cortisone shots is another way to deliver very strong anti-inflammatory medication. Yes, it's painful, but it works very quickly and also has very little side effects. And so, and people always worry about cortisone shots. Your body makes cortisone. There's nothing to be overly concerned about. It's just cortisone giving in the same area multiple times can weaken tissue. I tell people the foot, once again, it's an engineering marvel. It's very strong tissue down there. So I have no problem at all giving patients up to three cortisone shots in a year to calm it down. But it's amazingly how often one shot combined with stretching and massaging and therapy or shoes it can really help out. Shockwave therapy, platelet plasma, these are other modalities we use. Um, the shockwave therapy is not covered by insurance, and we don't do that here in Hawaii. Um, platelet rich protein. I don't know if much of you are familiar with a big and kind of a new thing in the last four or five years with orthopedics. Um, we actually draw blood out of your body and we spin in a centrifuge to make very strong, we call it platelet rich protein. It's a very strong healing component and we inject it back into the source of the injury, whether it's plantar fasciitis or tendonitis. Um, during surgery, we often do it too, especially our higher level athletes, but it's a very nice modality. Once again, unfortunately, it's not covered by insurance, uh, but it is an option if people are having pain, it's not going away. The big question everybody always wants to know, how long will it take to go away? And the difficult thing with medicine, surgery, it's, it's very variable. It's impossible to put a timeline on um, how long things will go away. Everybody is different. And that's kind of the fun thing with medicine also, is that everybody is unique. You need to tailor things to you know, meet people's needs across here. But typically, I tell patients, if you're consistent with your treatment, typically four to six weeks, your pain should go away. Once again, it's a huge spectrum. Some people go away in a few weeks. Some people take years to go away. Some people need cortisone shots. Some people need surgery. But typically, if you follow the treatment regimen, if you stick with it, in four to six weeks, the pain should go away. Surgery for plantar fasciitis. Once again, only about less than 1% of people require surgery. It actually is a great surgery. If it does come to that, people do very well with surgery. But once again, 99% of the time, we don't require surgery. The way I perform surgery, it's about a 10-minute outpatient procedure. It's minimally invasive, two small incisions, and I make a small little cut in the fascia and stretch it out. It's actually the least painful surgery I do, too, and very, very effective. The bad part is you're stuck in a cast for three weeks. I guess. That's always tell people. The surgery itself, not bad. Once it's healed up, it's great. But being stuck in a cast for three weeks is miserable. Um, I allow people to walk in the cast. I put a shoe on the bottom across there. So it isn't horrible, but taking baths and showers is very unpleasant, trying to shower with a, with a cast on. If you do surgery on your right foot, then you can't drive for three weeks also, which is always a horrible thing too. Thank goodness for me, Uber and Lyft have come around. It's made my life much easier for my patients for different surgeries. So simple strategies to keep pain-free. Basically a recap of everything we talked about. Stretching, stretching, stretching. And then modifying your activity. 
I'm always a big fan of exercising, and I always encourage my patients to exercise. And I always tell people, you don't have to stop exercising when you have plantar fasciitis or other, any other foot problem. It's just got to modify it. It's like, hey, if you walk for half an hour and it gets sore, well, try 15 or 20 minutes, or stick with a flatter course, makes you do a lot of stretching afterwards. The appropriate shoes makes a huge difference. Uh, once again, I look around, I see a lot of good appropriate shoes and sandals. And over time, you realize, hey, it makes a big difference wearing better shoes and sandals and especially slippers in the house. Don't overdo it. Back to the modify your activity. And that's the biggest thing of plantar fasciitis and other kind of tendonitis too, when you have shin splints or Achilles tendonitis, is that it warms up and you feel good. And so it's like, oh, I'm going to keep on exercising. The problem is a lot of times you're aggravating. So I always tell patients, don't gauge your activity by when you're feeling good. See how you feel the next day. If you go for a half an hour walk and you feel great, but the next day you get out of bed and it's horribly painful, well, that half an hour walk was too much. And then seeking help right away. And when you guys are all here because you're very health conscious across there too, whether it's your foot or your eyes or anything else, um, I treat a lot of diabetic patients. And unfortunately, I do a lot of surgery. I do a lot of amputations. And I tell patients 80% of the amputations I do are because people wait too long. And so addressing different conditions right away across there, whether you have diabetes and have an ulceration or a sore on your foot, whether you have plantar fasciitis, especially things like plantar fasciitis, it's not going to kill you. It's just aggravating. But the problem is you still need to be active. And you know, if your foot hurts, you either become less active or you start compensating. And so many patients come in starting off with plantar fasciitis. They go, yeah, it's been bothering me for a few months, but now my other foot hurts, or my back and my knee hurts because they've been walking funny for the last few months, compensating for these injuries. And so before you take a small problem and turn it into a big problem, seek medical attention. So once again, the right footwear, as we went over, something that's supportive, good cushioning, support. And the problem is nowadays there's just so much out there, uh, different information, and a lot of things feel great. And different shoes, uh, you know, people love... No, Skechers. I have people coming all day long with Skechers, which are okay. Um, they aren't the greatest. They're really soft, and so they feel really good at first, but they provide not that much support. So a lot of things like these softer shoes and sandals, yes, they feel good. If you're only walking or standing a short distance, then something soft is okay. But what you want is soft or something you know, that feels comfortable but also has some structure and support to it. Once again, it's engineering we need support and stability combined with the softness and support across there. And once again, avoid going barefoot, flip-flops, moccasin, ballet slippers. You know, once again, moderation is the key to everything. It's okay to go barefoot. It's so we're going to wear flats and ballet slippers in moderation. But if you're going to be walking around Almoana Shopping Center, I wouldn't be wearing my ballet flats. I don't want to go around, you know, all day long in you know, flat slippers across there too. So choose your shoe wear appropriately. Uh, so that's a little recap of the plantar fasciitis. Um, sorry if I was speaking quickly. I try slowing down. Common foot injuries among runners. I know runners, walkers, it's all the same thing. And I always tell patients, Hawaii is the greatest place for walking and running. You know, we have the best year-round weather across here. Um, just be careful on the streets. Um, but walking is a great way to exercise. And pretty much almost every day of the year here in Hawaii, we can go for a walk. And so walking, jogging, whatever you like to do, it's the cheapest, easy thing to do, too. You can squeeze it in any time of day. And especially nah, during the summertime, it does get warm here. But so people walk early in the morning or really early, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning, some people walk. But I tell people, hey, go for a nice walk in the morning. So once again, I have a lot of diabetic patients. I go, go for a nice short walk in the morning. Do it again after you eat, you know, in the evening time. Help your body process these sugars. So walking, running, really great way to exercise. Very cheap and very easy thing to do. And any kind of exercise you do helps your metabolism, helps keep your healthy across there. Common injuries in running. Once again, most of these injuries are caused by overuse or, or training errors. Once again, doing too much too soon or um, wearing inappropriate shoe wear or just ignoring our body. So I see a lot of stress fractures in the feet. Once again, as Leonardo da Vinci said, it's an engineering marvel. The little bones in our feet, there's 26 bones and 33 joints in each foot. These bones are very small. 
But you can jump off a 20-foot building and land on your foot and not break anything. You can also just step off the curb a little funny or trip over a pair of slippers and break these bones, especially the bones behind our toes called metatarsal bones. They're long, skinny bones, and at least two or three times a week, somebody comes in and they break their metatarsal bone. Once again, luckily, these heal without surgery. I put them in a cast or a boot for four to six weeks, and they typically heal. Besides a real fracture, we get a lot of stress fractures, especially these long metatarsal bones. And especially as we get older, if you have osteoporosis or osteopenia, or some mild weakening of the bones, you're really prone to getting stress fractures, especially those metatarsal bones. The good thing is they heal by themselves if you let them. And I always tell patients, almost everything I do, your body can heal if you allow it to do it. The problem with your foot, it's hard to be nice to your foot. We're always on our foot. Even if you're not, okay, I'm going to cut back on walking. Well, I'm still doing chores around the house. I'm still cooking and cleaning and gardening, or I have stairs, up and down stairs. And all those activities put a lot of strain on those muscles and bones in your feet. A stress fracture, typically, it's the bones behind your toes, these metatarsal bones across here. All of a sudden, you know, a stress fracture is going to be consistent, whereas the tendonitis and plantar fasciitis, it's painful at first and then kind of warms up. A stress fracture typically does not warm up. It'll stay consistently kind of achy or painful. Once again, it's typically not horribly painful, but it's, it's annoying. And, and if you continue to irritate that stress fracture, it can turn into a complete fracture, which may require surgery going into a cast or a boot. So once again, if you're feeling pain in your foot, well, the first thing is modify your activity, try and allow this to heal up. Once again, support makes a huge difference. Those little bones down there receive stress, especially when you're walking barefoot or stepping off the curb funny or stepping in a hole. So by wearing a more supportive boot or shoe, it helps allow that fracture to heal. I tell patients, when I do surgery, I put screws and plates across things to hold things in place. There's nothing magical with surgery. Typically with orthopedic surgery, we're holding bones in place to allow them to heal. So if a bone is not badly broken or not displaced, if you simply lay off of it, allow it to heal, you can re- avoid surgery, avoid being in a cast or a boot. Tendonitis, once again, plantar fasciitis is another form of tendonitis, but besides the plantar fascia, we have the Achilles tendon, so you get Achilles tendonitis. There's also a myriad of tendons around the ankle that we strain and get tendonitis for. I always tell patients, people always ask, you always say the same thing, resting, icing, anti-inflammatory medication, good shoes and support, and yeah, that takes care of the majority of problems across there, too. It's just we got to be told that over and over again. Um, lower leg pain, no calf muscle. We strain our calf muscle or, or injure it across there, too. Nerve-related conditions, really common in our foot. We, once again, ignore our feet. It's amazing how many nerves. The bottom of your foot, the palm of your hand, and your face have over half your sensory nerves. So the bottom of the foot, if you were stepped... Well, I still have young kids, not that young anymore, but you step on a Lego or anything else in the house barefoot, it's extremely painful. So our foot actually has a lot of nerves, and that's why, well, reflexology and all these other nerve treatments down there. Well, these nerves can also be aggravated. They can get pinched and irritated. Um, A very common walking or running injury is what we call Morton's neuroma. It's a pinched nerve up in the ball of the foot between the toes, and it's very difficult to differentiate between that and a um, stress fractures, that's why, once again, seeing a doctor and, and taking care of it. Skin and toenail problems. So that's the kind of nice thing about my job is that I take care of broken bones, I take care of diabetic patients and, and wounds, I take care of you no know, plantar fasciitis and, and bunions, but also I take care of simple things too. You no know, toenail problems, ingrown toenails, toenail fungus, different things like that, which cause problems. And if you ever had ingrown toenail before, it's extremely painful. I always tell patients, unless you've had them before, you don't realize how much pain a simple little thing like an ingrown toenail can cause. And once again, an ingrown toenail can lead to a bad infection, especially nowadays we have so many bad bacteria out there. And so ingrown toenails, I take care of at least two or three ingrown toenails every day. If they're bad or infected, I do a simple little procedure in the office, which provides immediate relief, and it's wonderful. If people have chronic ingrown toenails, actually I can remove part of the toenail so it never happens again across there, too, and it's probably the best thing I do. Oh, I'll give you one little special thing. Y'all can be excited. So probably someone in your family has toenail fungus, especially here in Hawaii. We can see everybody's toes. And, yeah, yeah. So toenails 
there's fungus all over the ground. It's the same fungus that causes athlete's foot. Nothing to worry about. It's not going to cause any serious infection, but it's not nice to have junk toenails. And so the toenail gets all thick and crumbly and junky looking, makes it very difficult to cut. You have to wear shoes, especially if you want to go to Vegas and the shoes rub against there, it's going to cause you pain. And so the toenail fungus, I've cured thousands and thousands of patients simply using Vicks VapoRub. Vicks VapoRub is the secret miracle for toenail fungus across there. The secret is you got to keep the toenails cut back really short. And so I tell people, it's an infection. Just like an abscess, you drain the abscess first, then you take antibiotics. For toenails, if you can cut the toenail back, have a pedicure cut back, or come and see me or one of my partners, we can cut the toenails back to where it's nice, healthy toenail there. Simply using Vicks VapoRub every day works miracles. It takes months. It takes you know, six months to a year for a toenail to grow out, so it depends on how bad that toenail is. If you stay on top of that toenail, a little bit of Vicks, you don't need to goop it on, too. A very thin layer of Vicks across there, too, it kills that fungus across there, too. I tell people, most people have a cell phone. After you clean the toenail, keep it cut back, take a picture, and then, because you're not going to see day-to-day results, but after a month, it's like, oh, that's getting better across there, too. And you stick with it, it works miracles. The reason why Vicks works so well, it has a good natural antifungal to it, eucalyptus oil, but more importantly, it doesn't come off. When you're kids, you put that stuff on your chest. When you wipe it off, there's still always a layer on there. And that's the secret, is that the Vicks is always on there, it's always smothering the fungus, always softening the toenail, and just works great. And there's also a lot of nasty chemicals in there, the menthol, the camphor, makes it very unhealthy for that, for that fungus to grow. So, yeah, so if you have friends or, you know, you don't have to admit it yourself, if you have it, keep the toe. And also, the reason why we get fungus, and we typically get our big toe and our baby toe first, is those are the toenails we injure. When you're walking or running, we bruise our toenails, or we damage our toenails, or you, you drop a can of soup or frozen chicken on your toe, and you damage that toenail there. Once that toenail is damaged, that's when the fungus gets in there. So any time a toenail gets damaged, trim the toenail back and start putting Vicks on there right away. Even if you don't think there's fungus, it's a good way to prevent it. So that's my huge secret. Once again, common injuries for walking and running is this overuse and require rest. And once again, it's not complete bed rest. You can still do activities. You can still exercise. It's modify your activities. Stress fracture, I went over before. It's a little hairline break. Once again, most commonly in our metatarsal bones, and those are those long skinny bones up in the ball, the foot across there. And once again, they typically go away in three to four weeks if you can be nice to it. I get patients all the time. They come back in three or four months later saying, it still hurts. You said three or four weeks. I go, well, you have to be nice to it. And the problem is you baby it for a week or two, and all of a sudden you overdo it. As soon as you re-injure it, it happens again. Um, We can also get stress fractures in our shin bones, like shin splints and their heel bones. But most commonly, it's the metatarsal bones. And then mostly it's pain. Sometimes you get a little swelling there. And once again, resting once again, over and over again. And people always say, it's, what do you, you always say resting, icing, Advil, changing shoes, take it easy, and most things get better. And then for tendonitis, I was going over earlier, you know, the plantar fascia is basically, a, it's a ligament, but a tree like tendonitis. And then also around the ankle, the Achilles tendon, and around the ankle joint too. And... Tendonitis is a little more dangerous because if you continue to aggravate that tendon, it can eventually partially tear or completely rupture across there too. And then if that occurs, oftentimes you require surgery. So, you know, I was thinking these aren't life or death issues, but you need to not just blow off these injuries across there or these aggravations. Once again, back to the resting, icing, Advil. So my job is actually pretty easy. Yeah. <laughs> and so we already talked about plantar fasciitis. So lower leg pain, and, you know, really commonly when you exercise, we strain our calf muscle or the shin splint, the muscles along our shins across there, especially shin splints. Um, It can be really painful, very similar to plantar fasciitis, but it's up in your leg along your shin. And especially bad shoes is probably the biggest culprit for for shin splints. Um, The wearing more supportive walking shoes, running shoes makes a huge difference. Uh, That's one time also I make custom art supports, the majority of the time, the ones at my stores or ones you buy at um, running shoe stores are, are good enough for plantar fasciitis. But shin splints are one of those times that um, I take care of a lot of the UH athletes. And for shin splints, I always tell you, you really need custom orthotics. And I actually make a custom mold because that little extra support I make with my custom ones really makes a big difference with shin splints. Um, shin splints can 
progress to be you know, stress fractures, and it takes months and months for that to go away if it happens in your shin, muscle, shin, shin bone. So it's really important to listen to leg pain. As we get older, too, you know, my older patients, I, I'm more concerned about leg pain also, is that the, not so much a running injury, but circulation issues. Uh, once again, I, I mentioned I treat a lot of diabetic patients, and unfortunately I, I do a lot of amputations and wound care. Poor circulation, and so it's a warning sign if you're having pain in your calf muscle. We call it claudication, and so a lot of patients, as, as you get older, also your arteries and your legs are like pipes, and they naturally get clogged up over time. Different medical conditions, you know, diabetes, high cholesterol, make your arteries more clogged down there. Smoking, other risk factors, um, poor diet, low exercise also makes your arteries clog up. If your circulation is bad to your feet, you know, that's when we run into a lot of problems, and that's the majority of reasons why we have to do amputations is poor circulation. Some of the warning signs is that, well, if you're getting a lot of swelling in your legs, um, discoloration. You know, you look around and you see people having dark legs across there too. Well, part of it's diabetes, part of it's swelling in the legs, part of it's circulation. So if you're noticing, you know, increased swelling to your legs, um, discoloration, then seeing your primary care physician is a good idea to get checked for circulation or uh, congestive heart failure or kidney problems. Um, I work very closely with our vascular surgeons here at, at Queens and at Polymomy um, because I'm kind of the, the watchdog for circulation issues. So almost every patient that comes in, the first thing I do, I check the circulation on their feet. So the top of your foot has a pulse just like our wrist and just like our throat, the top of your foot and the back of the leg. So making sure they have a good pulse down there is very important. Checking out what we call the capillary field time. When you squeeze a toe, it pinks up within a few seconds across there. The skin, you know, looking at the skin, seeing the, the, the coloring of the skin across there, all those are risk factors for having poor circulation, especially with circulatory issues across there, too. You know, quick treatment is very, very important. Tendonitis is, once again, it's nice. Most tendonitis is, it's not going to cause any major issues, but when patients come in with really poor circulation, they're complaining of pain in their calves, whether they're walking you know, one or two blocks and they have to stop because their calves hurt, or they're walking and... Um, or at night, you know, if you're walking, it's what we call claudication or intermittent claudication in your calf muscle. It's a sign that your arteries are clogged up down there. And after you know, two blocks of walking, that muscle down there is requiring the, the blood to get down there. It's not getting enough, so that's why it becomes very painful and you need to stop. You rest for a while, the blood gets down there, and you're able to walk again. Well, if, if you're getting bad claudication, we need to have to see the vascular surgeon. Once again, nobody wants surgery, but it's much better to do surgery early on. And a lot of times they can basically, you know, kind of rotor rooter out your arteries. They can angioplasty them or stent them or, worst case, bypass them. But it's going to stop you from, unfortunately, you know, losing your feet or your legs across there. So if you're noticing, don't be overly concerned. Oh, I got pain in my calf. I'm going to lose my leg. It's one of those things that's something to watch out for. If you're noticing more and more cramping in your calf muscle, you no, know, you're only able to walk a few blocks because of the pain across there. A really bad time, once you get really bad circulation to your feet, even simply laying in bed, a lot of patients complain of pain in their feet or the legs across there because the circulation is not good enough across there too. And they, they feel like if they dangle their legs over the bed, the blood gets better. Well, because gravity is helping. If you need gravity to get your blood pumping, you're in big trouble. And so you know, if you start having more and more calf pain, you're getting discoloration, your feet are feeling more and more cool, then seeing me, your primary doctor, and, and getting evaluated by vascular surgery. And I always tell patients, don't worry, we will send you there first, and they can run a scan just to you know, get a baseline view. And once again, seeing the circulation, they can monitor over time. Uh, tarsal tunnel syndrome, once again, we talked about there's a lot of nerves in our feet, really common for walkers or runners, we call Morton's neuroma up in the ball of the foot, but also around the ankle. It's very similar to carpal tunnel syndrome in our wrists. In the ankle, we call it tarsal tunnel syndrome. And once again, it's mostly um, not supportive shoes and sandals enough. So you're putting a lot of strain on the ankle, which causes the nerve to get pinched. So you might get numbness or tingling throughout the foot. Morton's neuroma, as I talked about. So with the Morton's neuroma, if any kind of nerve symptom, it can give you a whole myriad of, of symptoms. You can get numbness, you can get tingling, burning pain. You feel like you're walking on a lump across there. The thing of nerve pain, it can come and go. People always say, oh, it doesn't hurt today. I go, well... If it comes and goes randomly like that, only basically a nerve can cause symptoms that are so inconsistent where it can be horribly painful one minute and then go away. We talked about you know, skin and toenail injuries. And 
once again, I deal with a lot of kind of Menini issues, you no know, toenail problems, but also you know, corns and calluses. Once again, as we get older, our feet become more bony. Once again, you no know, wearing good shoes and sandals to get extra padding. You know, corns and calluses are caused basically from friction and pressure. And as we get older, we get more and more bony down there. So what happens if, if you're walking barefoot or a pair of shoes is rubbing funny, not enough cushioning, then you're irritating that bone area and your body's actually trying to protect itself. So corns and calluses are good in some ways. They're actually protecting your bone from rubbing and developing a hole there. The problem is when that corn or callus gets too thick, it can become very painful because it gets very hard and it's pressing right on that bony prominence across there too. So what I typically do, well, I usually shave down that corner callus. If it's a really deep corner callus, I have some magic acid I put on there, which doesn't hurt when you come in, but then the next day it really hurts badly. That's after you've already left. <clears throat> but it's amazing how well it works. And I love taking care of horrible little corns, especially on the bottom of the foot. It's virtually impossible for you to remove a corn. You know, as we get older, even when you know, you're 20 years old, it's hard to reach the bottom of your foot. But as we get older, it's very hard to remove anything from the bottom of your foot. So a simple little thing for me to do is, you know, take a scalpel and pop out these little hard corns on the bottom of the foot, and I put this acid on there. Sometimes it takes two or three treatments, but taking that little hard seed out of the bottom of your foot, it's like you know, taking the splinter out of the paw of the, of the lion there. It's, just, it's amazing how much, for such a simple little thing, I love doing that. And so, yeah. The, uh, and then, once again, it, hard corns come back over time because of the way we walk, but if you routinely file down that corn or callus or wear good shoes and sandals, they don't come back. I also have patients that almost clockwork, like once a year they come in, they go, yep, that corn came back. Almost every year they come in, and I pop it out of there, and see them. I'll see you next year. Yeah. <laughs> and then tip number one, once again, if something hurts, you know, modify your activity. If it's really bad, come and see the doctor. But so many different things, this modifying your activity, resting, ice, Advil, massaging, stretching, takes care of a lot of different issues. Adopt good running or walking practices, you know, it's one of those things, be realistic. Don't all of a sudden have a, a goal to, you know, run five days a week or walk five days a week or lose 20 pounds in, in a week or something. Have realistic goals and then stick with it. You know, it's one of those things that, especially as we get older, it's just sticking with routines, exercise routines, stretching routines, you know, eating routines across there makes a big difference. Um, we only have a few more minutes, but... One of the things I take care of a lot, bunions and hammer toes, which, once again, are just deformities up in the football of the foot. And bunions and hammer toes, you can usually blame mom and dad for them a lot. You know, a lot of things we get is mostly inherited. Yes, certain shoes can make bunions worse or hammer toes worse. Yes, injuries uh, can make you know, things worse. I had a, a, one of my UH soccer girls, she injured her foot last year, and she had bad turf toe or, or tortal ligaments to her big toe, and she developed a very bad bunion within a year because... Bunions and hammer toes are basically our fingers and toes should be in balance. And whether naturally they're becoming contracted or you damage them, uh, they can become contracted over time. Bunions and hammer toes, of everything, you try and live with them as best you can. You know, wearing accommodative shoes and padding. Luckily here in Hawaii, we can wear slippers and sandals a lot. Um, I wear nice wide shoes. I always tell patients, I've been here almost 20 years now, um, I still fix, it's the most common surge I do is bunions and hammer toes, but... I treat much larger ones here because when I used to practice in San Francisco, wearing dress shoes all day long, people with very small bunions and hammer toes, they would have surgery right away. Here, uh, we can wear slippers and everything else. So, but once the toes start crossing over and you, know, you can't get your feet to fit in the shoes anymore or you start getting secondary pain, because as your toes deviate, once again, your foot, the alignment starts changing across there and you start developing secondary problems. You start getting you know, neuromas, you start getting pain, stress fractures because those bones are not working properly. And I tell you, probably at least half the bunions I fix aren't because of bunions causing pain. It's because they're having secondary problems. They're getting stress fractures. They're getting neuromas. They're having a hard time getting shoes to fit properly. And there's a picture. Once again, you see the... You know, when you have a bunion, I don't know if you know, what a bunion is a, a bump behind your big toe joint on the side there. And people always think it's a, a bump. And over time, the bump does get larger and irritated from calcium and irritation. But you can see in that picture, it's more of a deviation problem. The big toe is going towards that second toe. And once again, you can typically blame mom or dad for it. And as the big toe goes to the side right there, it drives that big bone where it's red across there too. That Where it's red, that's what we call the first metatarsal bone. The first metatarsal bone is a big, strong bone across there. It's supposed to carry most of our weight. And 
So when it's not lined up across there, it's not happy. So once again, for bunions, shoes, padding, being nice to it, and if it gets really bad, come and see me. I guess I've used up my time already, so we'll stop there.